Welcome back to Proxam, everybody. And uh, today we're actually going to be talking about the uh, Beale Tancraft world. And we're going to be looking at an army building guide around them. I've done a couple of these before on Uthway and Iandin, so I thought I'd give the Beale Tan a chance. And uh, what we're going to be asking ourselves is, can the Beale Tan be competitive while remaining lore friendly? And is it possible to build a list around uh, this craft world while remaining competitive on the tabletop? So the goals of this guide are going to kind of be the same as before. Um, we're going to be doing an overview of the craft world specifics and unique rules to the Beeltan. We're going to be looking at what units are effective with the craft world and what combos you can pull off with the craft world um, with their special traits and so forth. And we're also going to look at how do we remain lore friendly while being competitive on the tabletop as well. Because we do want to make sure that it feels like we're playing a Beeltan army. And not something completely different, right? I mean, that's why we play Beeltan is to field lots of aspect warriors. So um, we're, the first thing we're going to look at is the Beeltan trait, which is called Natural Leader. And I actually think this is one of the best Warlord traits um, in the entire Codex. Because what it allows you to do is it essentially gives you an extra guide that you can use um, within, a, within um, six inches on a friendly core unit. So... Um, basically you just, you know, choose a friendly Beeltan core unit within six inches and that unit essentially can reroll all hits, shooting and close combat for the rest of the turn. Um, and because it's not a psychic power, you don't have to roll to cast it, which makes it very reliable and it can't be denied by enemy, uh, deny the witches because again, it's not a psychic power. So, um, it's really reliable. Um, and it's something that you'll probably be using every single turn. Now, um, on to the um, relic, the Beeltan relic, the Spirit Stone of Analathan. Now, um, this relic is actually pretty decent. It's not the best, I don't think, but it is good, and it's definitely worth spending a command point on um, if you have a Farseer that is um, not using any other relics. So basically, it gives you one additional psychic power from their chosen discipline, whether that be Runes of Fate or Runes of Fortune. And once per psychic phase, it allows you to reroll one psychic test. Um, so it doesn't allow you to cast an extra power, but it does allow you to know one. And this is really important because this gives the Farseer some versatility. And of course, um, being able to reroll one psychic test is actually very useful. And, you know, kind of gives you some flexibility on, you know, when or not you want to use your strands of fate. You won't always have to use the strands of fate right away. You can reroll a test like a focus will or something like that. So it's a pretty good um, relic. And the last thing is the um, Wrath of the Shrines. Now this is the Beeltan Stratagem. And what it basically does is you choose a unit, whether they're going to shoot or fight. And until the end of that phase, every time a model in that unit makes an attack, an unmodified hit roll of six scores an additional hit. So obviously this is really powerful. This gives the unit a lot more attacks. Um, and you know, you could use this in the shooting phase or in the assault phase. So it's very flexible. And this actually works extremely well with a lot of aspect warriors, a lot of units that have special rules, um, on to wound. So for example, striking scorpions, um, have the Manda blaster special rule, which means on sixes to wound, they actually get a mortal wound in addition to any normal damage. Well, the more attacks you have, the greater chances of this proccing. So, um, speaking of striking scorpions, uh, what units are good with the Beeltan, right? So, a lot of people might think that, you know, in general, aspect warriors are good and that all aspect warriors are good with the Beeltan. Now, that's mostly true. A lot of the aspect warriors are really good with the Beeltan, but not really so much because of their craft world traits, but more for their um, ability to take that stratagem, Wrath of the Shrines. So... Really, when we look at um, what units are good with the Beeltan, Howling Banshees are very good. Howling Banshees actually make great use of a couple things. Striking Scorpions, Wraith Lords are good, believe it or not. Swooping Hawks, Warp Spiders, Warlocks, Fire Prisms. And honestly, the Beeltan Craft World has the blessing of being good and effective with a lot of different units in the Codex, um, including units you wouldn't think normally would be good with them. But there's just... 
kind of too many to list, but it's essentially um, aspect warriors and units that do um, well supporting aspect warriors are all good with Beltan. So the first unit we're going to look at is Howling Banshees. Now, Howling Banshees are really fast moving and they actually make great use of the Croft World trait because they can charge after advancing. So um, that, you know, rolls of one to two count as three ad for advances in battle focus. Um, Croft World trait is actually pretty useful with Howling Banshees uh, because that means they'll be able to at least guarantee that they can get a three. So you can plan your charges more accordingly um, and, you know, kind of you know, plan ahead of time how far your Howling Banshees actually have to be from the enemy, which can be useful because Howling Banshees are pretty fragile. Um, they can also dis dish out a lot of damage and reroll one hit when they shoot and fight in close combat. Remember, they do have pistols as well as close combat weapons uh, via their Banshee Blade, which is a very powerful um, weapon in close combat. And they're also a great candidate for the Wrath of Shrine stratagem because they have a lot of attacks, um, especially the Exarch, because the Exarch has the ability with Mirror Swords to double her attacks. So the Exarch actually gets 10 attacks um, on charge, and with Wrath of the Shrines, this can be exceptionally powerful on this unit, even a unit of 5. And uh, next up, we have Striking Scorpion. So just like Howling Banshees, um, they work really well with the Wrath of the Shrines, Um Stratagem, probably the best as well because Striking Scorpions have a lot of attacks and they also um, have a special effect on their wound roll. When they roll a 6 to wound, they get a mortal wound in addition to any normal damage due to their Manda Blaster ability. And yes, um, the Wrath of the Shrines Stratagem actually does work with Manda Blasters, um, even though Sustained Assault does not. So... Uh, their regular ability, Sustained Assault, means every 6 to hit they roll, they get an additional hit. But that additional hit does not actually benefit from Manda Blasters. However, Wrath of the Shrines does not say that it doesn't, so it actually does. So these extra hits will actually be um, able to be affected by the Manda Blasters rule. And uh, the rerolling one hit pairs really well with the Exarch's Crushing Blow power because... With Crushing Blow, you auto-wound. So it essentially makes sure that the XR can get all of his hits um, and make sure he's doing the maximum amount of damage. Striking Scorpions are also very effective because they're pretty independent on their own. They have advanced positions, and they don't really have any um, direct need for a transport, which will save you some points um, on your list. And Wraith Lords believe it or not, are actually really good with um, Aspect Warriors because they do a great job supporting Aspect Warriors by using their heavy weapons, um, and they have a lot of staying power in combat, and they can actually deal with a lot of targets that, um, you know, Striking Scorpions, Howling Banshees, and Dire Avengers cannot deal with. Really heavy tanks, really heavy infantry that would just mulch all of those units. And um, the reroll to hit also works great with the Wraith Lord's heavy weapons and in close combat as well. And in a pinch, Wraith Lords can also advance um, if they need to get to an objective or something like that really quick um, and you need the extra range. You know, it might not be a bad idea to advance with it, even though you can't fire heavy weapons in advance. Um, you could still use it to get to objectives and things like that um, if you really need it. So it does kind of work with them too. And then we have Swooping Hawks. So Swooping Hawks are another unit that are a great candidate for the Wrath of the Shrines um, stratagem because they have a lot of attacks. They have four attacks apiece. And I think the most interesting thing about the Swooping Hawks is that they have the um, Exarch power suppressing fire, which is great at preventing overwatch and denying enemy actions. So you can follow up with your combat units um, later on and you can do that safely so that they don't get overwatched to death. And they also have fantastic objective control. And the thing about Swooping Hawks, if you want to run them as a bigger unit, maybe a unit of 10 or something like that, you can give them the Swooping Evasion um, Exarch Power, which gives them a minus one to hit. Um, enemy units need a minus one to hit when shooting at them. And you can also give them the Phoenix Plume, which essentially gives them a five plus feel no pain, um, you know, to deny wounds and stuff like that. So it makes the unit actually 
uh, fairly tough to kill. And the fact that they can also go all around the board and hide and stuff like that makes them an ideal target, um, you know, for the Beltan lists. Now, uh, Warp Spiders are another great unit for the Beltan. And the reason why they're fantastic is because they have the ability to deny and lock down areas of the board and terrain and stuff like that it makes it very hard for enemies to actually move around and get to objectives they have an exarch power called the spider's layer and the spider's layer is absolutely insane it basically means that um when the warp spiders are in terrain once per game they can select that piece of terrain that they're in um and basically web it and any enemy model ending a move within that piece of terrain will take d3 wounds mortal wounds um and is it minus two speed or minus two movement i should say so it makes it extremely hard for units to actually um you know kind of move through terrain and you know if an objective is behind terrain that unit is basically not going to be able to move through it and on top of that uh this protects the warp spiders as well because the warp spiders will basically be impossible to assault they're a great hit and run unit as well they can soften up enemy targets for your um, combat warriors, well, combat aspect warriors to finish off later during the assault phase. And lastly, the craft roll trait actually prevents war the warp gem generator from rolling double ones, as rolls of one or two count as a three instead. So essentially what this means is that they're essentially immune um, to rolling double ones. So that means that you'll never have to worry about losing one uh, when they use their battle focus move. So pretty good. Um, that's to my understanding. If anyone thinks that it doesn't work this way, please do let me know in the comments. I believe it does work this way because it says count every roll as one or two as a three. So um, I believe that that means that no matter what, um, the warp spiders cannot actually uh, be affected by their negative uh, warp gem generator roll. So it doesn't happen very often. Double ones doesn't happen very often, but it might happen once in a while and it'll save you a warp spider when it does. And next up is warlocks. So warlocks wouldn't seem like a unit that's very good with Beeltan, but they're actually fantastic. I wouldn't overload on them like I would in an Uthway list, but um, warlocks provide multiple buffs and debuffs to pass around to weaken enemy units while strengthening uh, strengthening your own and especially in close combat they have a lot of uh, close combat oriented powers enhance and power which both uh, make your aspect warriors extremely deadly and i mean warlocks are not that bad in combat themselves they offer a lot of you know substantial power in close combat they have staying power unlike a lot of the aspect warrior units they make a great center line uh, to revolve your attacks around and they provide an extra layer of psyche defense, especially if you have a big unit of, of five or six. Uh, they can actually, um, you know, not only cast two powers, but also deny a power um, that your enemy tries to cast at you. And lastly, we have fire prisms. So fire prisms are probably one of the best units to take as Beeltan because they make the best use out of the reroll one hit uh, craft roll trait. Especially on their lance profile, this can make them extremely accurate and extremely deadly with their attacks. Especially against harder to hit targets like the Harpy, Flying Hive Tyrant, um, things like that. Or, you know, maybe units that want to use a stratagem to give them minus one to hit. Um, basically, the Fire Prism just does not care about these things. It will hit you very easily, especially if you have a Crystal Targeting Matrix. And um, if you use the linked fire ability, it could be even more powerful because now you're ignoring invul saves. So not only are you ignoring the um, enemy's negative hit modifiers, but you're also ignoring their armor saves. And this can be extremely effective against things like harpies and flying hive tyrants and other um, kind of hard to hit targets. All right, so um, I'm I'm going to show you guys a um, army list that I created. Um, now, again, this army list is just um, meant as a kind of example of what a Beeltan army might look like. There's a lot of changes that you can make to it depending on your personal preferences. Um, and it's by no means an optimized or the most competitive of Beeltan lists. Um, I'm not showing it to you guys to say, oh, here's the best list, but just give you an idea of what 
a BL10 list um, might look like on paper. So what we have here is we have a battalion detachment. Um, it's going to be a strike force game of 2,000 points, and we have the Crawford BL10, and our starting command points are 12. So pretty standard here. Um, you know, the battle uh, battalion detachment counts as two command points, but because our warlord is in it, that refunds the command cost. Um, and again, we are using the Crawford BL10, and it's a strike force game. Now, um, as always for HQ, we have it maxed out. We have two Farseer uh, Skyrunners. In the Beeltan army, your Farseers need to be very fast because they need to be able to catch up with your various Aspect Warriors and transports. So your Aspect Warriors that you're going to be using are typically really quick, and you need HQ units that can keep up with them. So the first uh, Warlord we have is uh, the Farseer Skyrunner with Guide and Doom. And he comes in at 120 points, but we're going to go ahead and give him the Warlord trait Natural Leader, which is the Beeltan Warlord trait. Essentially gives him another guide. So this is going to be more of a mid-range Farseer. He's going to be in the middle of the field, casting Psychic Powers, buffing your uh, friendly units, and also debuffing the enemies with Doom. Um, because of the Spirit Stone of Analethan, which is his relic, he can also choose another power. Um, that's really your choice. I didn't put it down here because, you know, it just depends what you guys are running. But typically, I would give him Will of Azurian. Um, this will allow you to make units con um, objective secured um, as you need it throughout the battle. Then for our secondary HQ, we have another Farseer Skyrunner with Ghost Walk and Focus Will. Focus Will is used to cast on the main Farseer, your Warlord, so he can cast his powers easier. And Ghost Walk um, is cast to allow your units to charge better um, when you need it because you're going to have a lot of combat units in your army and... This will actually increase their threat range uh, to where they can assault enemy units. Um, he also has the Warlord trait, Champion of the Eldari, um, you know, uh, basically giving him another Warlord trait. And he has Seer of the Shifting Vector, which will make up for the command point cost over the course of the game. And he has the Relic, um, the Phoenix Gem, to help keep him alive because typically this model will be closer to the front lines as Ghost Walk has a shorter range of 12, so you're gonna need him closer to be able to use that. Uh, so he has the Phoenix Gem to help keep him alive. And then lastly, we have an Autark Skyrunner with Laser Lance. Um, he has the Warlord trait Fate's Messenger, again, something to help keep him alive um, when he's shot at, and he has the um, Relic Sunstorm, which helps him uh, capture objectives and be a little bit faster. So he's kind of your lone wolf and support unit, so Early in the game, he's going to be supporting your units, charging in with them, giving them all sorts of buffs. And then later in the game, he's going to break off and capture objectives and um, basically make sure that you have an objective secured um, character that can steal objectives away from enemy units and things like that um, in the middle to late game. So kind of a more of a versatile uh, piece here that can either do objective control or support your army um, in combat and shooting. And for our troops, it's pretty self-explanatory. Because we're going to be spending so much on Aspect Warriors, we're going to need the cheapest troops possible, which are our Rangers. Um, the other reason why we're going to take Rangers is because of the Scout the Enemy secondary objective. This objective is very easy to use, especially with Rangers, and you can probably max out your 15 points by the end of the game um, if you use it correctly. And Rangers are just typically a good support unit anyway for laying down a little bit of sniper fire. And our elite section is probably the biggest section we have. We start off with a Warlock Skyrunner with Protect and Jinx. This is just to negate some enemy armor. And also, um, you know, kind of make it harder for your units to die with Protect as needed. Although, to be honest, you'll probably be using Jinx a lot more in games. And you can use this model to um, kind of do your psychic actions and things like that. So for your psychic secondaries, he's also useful. And we also have six Warlocks with Enhance and Drain and Empower and Enervate um, with the Seer Council Stratagem to give your Farseer that plus one uh, to its Psychic Tests. Um, and the six Warlocks are really just there to help support your uh, melee Aspect Warriors, to give them buffs to make them more powerful so that your smaller units can actually take out bigger units and um, be more cost-effective in the game. And they're also pretty good on their own. Um, they have two wounds each, and they have... 
a four plus invulnerable save as well. So they're a little more durable and have a little more staying power than the rest of your aspect warriors. We have five Howling Banshees, the XR Casimir Swords, Crone Scream, uh, with the Relic of the Shrine Stratagem and Piercing Strikes. Uh, Crone Scream isn't really necessary, but the, we just kind of threw it on there because we're actually um, using the Relic for uh, Swooping Hawks and I'll, or Stratagem for the Swooping Hawks, and I'll tell you about that a little, little later um, when we go over the Swooping Hawks. But um, essentially... Crone Scream just basically does D3 uh, Mortal Wounds to the enemy. Um, you can only use it once a game, so it's not that great, but it's not that bad either. And uh, Piercing Strikes d basically gives uh, plus one damage to the attacks of the Exarch. Combined with Mirror Swords, this is insane. And I talk a little bit about this um, in my video about Howling Banshees, but essentially it's just a very cost-effective unit that if used correctly can kill multiple units of enemies without suffering a single casualty in combat. We also have five Striking Scorpions. The Exarch has a Biting Blade and Crushing Blows. This unit um, is really to be used in conjunction um, with other units um, in taking out enemy targets that are isolated. Um, striking Scorpions are very good at doing this. They're also very good at taking out um, characters and killing units that have invul saves due to their ability to deal mortal wounds. And lastly, we have a Wraith Lord with two Shuriken Cannons, two Shuriken Cannonpolts, and the Ghost Glaive. And the Wraith Lord's job is to support your Aspect Warriors to deal with targets that they cannot deal with on their own. Heavy vehicles, heavy monsters, and things like that, which Howling Banshees and Striking Scorpions might struggle with. Wraith Lords can take out either at range with two Shuriken Cannons to pepper them down, or in combat with the Ghost Glaive, which absolutely demolishes big targets. And for our fast attack slot, we actually went with 10 Swooping Hawks with the Exarch. Has the Phoenix Plume um, Relic, which gives them a 5 plus feel no pain essentially, which means that after they fail armor saves for each wound loss, they can roll a dice, and on a 5 plus, they don't lose that wound. So pretty effective, and they have the Suppressing Fire um, basically trait, which allows, or um, Exarch Power, which allows them to um, basically negate the overwatch and set to defend of units that um, the Exarch shoots at. So you could choose to shoot the Exarch at another squadron of um, you know enemies or whatever, um, and they can't overwatch, they can't set to defend, and if they were performing any actions, those actions automatically fail. So it's also a great way to deny the enemy objective points uh, for their secondary objectives. Then we have a squad of five warp spiders. The Exarch has the dual death spinners and the spider's lair. Exarch power, which um, just essentially, like I said before, can lock down areas of the board. It makes it very hard for your enemy to move through terrain and get to objectives when they need to. So be patient with this ability. Don't use it right off the bat. Save it for a time when your opponent really needs to get to an objective. And guess what? Your warp spiders are going to be there waiting with spiders layer for them. So it's going to make it very hard for that opponent to capture those objectives and move through that piece of terrain. And for our heavy support category, we actually went with three fire prisms. Um, now, this is kind of debatable. You don't need three fire prisms. You could just do two fire prisms if you wanted to and do something else. But um, I went with three in this list. I think fire prisms work exceptionally with the Beeltan. One of them has a crystal targeting matrix, and this is just so that when you combine shots with linked fire, the linked fire stratagem, um, you could ignore the benefits of cover on the fire prism that has the crystal targeting matrix. And they're essentially just there to deal with the heaviest tanks and monstrous creatures that the enemy has to get rid of those so that your aspect warriors can finish off the rest of the army. Then we have a wave serpent with twin shrinking cannon. Uh, we like to keep it cheap. The twin shrinking cannon is the free option. It's also a very powerful weapon on its own. Um, and this will be transporting the howling banshees and the warlocks into the front lines to support your other aspect warriors and things like that. And that comes in at exactly 2,000 points with six command points left for your first couple turns. And, you know, a lot of these units you'll pretty much find replaceable. So, for example, if you don't want to go with the squad of 10 Swooping Hawks, you can definitely switch those out for Warp Spiders or you can switch those out for other units. Um, or if you just want to do a squad of five Swooping Hawks and maybe you want to do a squad of 10 Striking Scorpions, you can definitely do that as well. There's a lot in this list that you can switch around to suit your needs. 
But essentially, this is what a Bealtan army kind of should look like. A lot of aspect warriors with a couple of support units that are meant to boost the combat potential of those aspect units. So for example, the unit of warlocks can boost the Howling Banshees considerably, um, giving them plus one to hit on charge um, and giving the enemy uh, minus one to wound as well. Um, can be a very powerful combination, basically ensuring that the Banshees win their close combat trades. Or, for example, um, your Farseer casting Guide on a unit of Swooping Hawks, and then using the Wrath of the Shrine stratagem to essentially make sure that that unit of Swooping Hawks is going to be uh, devastatingly effective at killing infantry. Um, and Swooping Hawks, even though they don't have any AP on their weapons, are extremely cost-effective at dealing with light infantry and even heavy infantry if given the right buffs, especially if the enemy has something like Jinx on them. And then things like the Wraith Lord. The Wraith Lord is really just there to hold down and give your um, army some presence on objectives and some staying power, and also able to support your Aspect Warriors um, and deter enemies from trying to assault your units. Um, no one wants to assault into something if they know they're going to be killed by a Wraith Lord next turn. So it really gives, you know, your opponent, makes your opponent think twice about getting close to certain units that you might have on the board. So in conclusion, I think, to be honest, um, I think even though the Bealtan Crawford has a reputation as being one of the uh, more um, uncompetitive Crawfords, I think it has actually the, the potential to be very, very hard-hitting, very fast, and reliable. Being able to generate a lot of army-wide rerolls all game, and being able to hit and run consistently, um, and basically make use of better advance and battle focus roles to be one step ahead of the enemy. Um, however, to be successful with the Bealtan, you can't just use all Aspect Warriors. You have to use some non-Aspect units, and this can include Warlocks, Wraith Lords, um, and you know, I didn't mention this in the video before, but Vipers are also a very good um, option if you want to support your Aspect Warriors. A couple units of Vipers to be used as screens, um, also to be used as, fire, uh, you know, kind of fire, a little bit of a fire support unit could be very useful as well for screening out your very fragile aspect warriors. So um, essentially the Bealtan army is an army of speed, it's an army of quickness, and also strategy. You have to use a lot of different units performing a lot of different roles for it to work effectively, but when it does work effectively, it can work brilliant and it can look spectacular on the battlefield um, and make it very hard for your enemy to retaliate under the right guidance all right everybody um that's it for today's video if you guys have any comments to add uh to this video about the bealtan or if you have any experiences with the bealtan craft world let me know and let me know also what units have worked for you when running the bealtan i'd love to know i've actually been running um bealtan armies for a while myself they're the, kind of the oldest craft world that i ever picked up um and even though they're a little bit different now because they have you know more unique traits i still Really like the play style of the units and the army in general. So yeah, let me know if you guys have anything to add to this um, in the comments. And um, yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you guys um, learned something. And I will see you guys next time. Peace out, everybody. See you later.